I've recorded this uh, a couple of days after my initial video this week was meant to come out because that video didn't come out and then I was recording the other video and then I thought, well, this video is not going to make it out today after all, a couple of days after it was meant to come out. So I'll record a little special bit at the start of the video to say, sorry the video this week is late, but also if you're in York at the start of August, go to York Georgian Festival. It's at the Mansion House and they're not paying me to say this. This isn't a sponsored thing. So YouTube, please don't demonetize me. Um, but I'm doing it as a favor for, for a friend who's organizing it because it's really cool and it's the first event of its kind. And it's in the Mansion House, which is an 18th century mansion where the Lord Mayor of York lives. Well, it's the official residence of the Lord Mayor of York. I don't think, don't think they actually live there anymore because they've already got a house. But anyway, go to the Georgian Festival because it's going to be really cool and you'll have a fantastic time. The they do, they're doing fan language. They're doing, the, they're doing a workshop on fan language and they've got dance workshops and it's going to be really cool. And Terry Deary is going to be there. The actual Horrible Histories guy is going to be there. So if you're in or around York, first week of August, have a look at the link in the description. Go to the York Georgian Festival. If you see me, say hello, because people keep seeing me and not saying hello. And I always say, if you see me, say hello. So if you see me, say hello. Right, toilets. <laughs> So initially, this week's video was going to be a really violent, gory method of execution known as the Blood Eagle, and then I started doing all of my research into it, and I remembered how gory it was, and how depressing it was, and how depressing it was that everybody who talks about the Blood Eagle goes into the minutiae of whether or not you can pull bits of people out, and can you keep them alive, and can you torture them properly with it, and I thought, do you know what, I don't want to do a video about this, this is just miserable, this is just crap, and... I'm having a rough time of it at the minute, so I thought I'd do something a bit more cheerful. So this video is about toilets. Now, if you have ever been to a historic site with me, you've ever been to a castle with me or a monastery, you'll know one of the places that I like to beeline towards is the drainage. I find historical drainage and sewer systems fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And some of the abbeys in the borders of Scotland have just got the most spectacularly well-preserved drainage systems. It, it really is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think Kelso's is really good. Anyway, it's very, very cool. And people often have these images, these Blackadder images of people just chucking buckets of poo out of their window in the streets and people just getting covered in filth and emptying what they used to call your night soil, your poo buckets out into the street. And that is what happened. People did that. That is a thing. And the way that medieval people and early medieval people pooped is actually quite interesting. There is a lot of, there's a lot of difference between, for example, your urban pooper and your rural pooper. Your urban pooper in somewhere like, let's call it Anglo-Saxon London, has a number of options in terms of how they can get rid of their nasty, dirty filth. And one of the one of the ways that you get rid of it is simply by chucking it into the street. But obviously, if you chuck your poo into the street, the street's covered in poo. Nobody wants a street covered in poo, and that's a waste of poo. The other option you have is the one that we see probably most commonly archaeologically, and that is to have a cesspit. And London was covered in cesspits. A lot of people say London is a cesspit, but medieval London, early medieval London as well, was covered in these little pits. And they're not big, most of them. They're domestic cesspits, you know, a couple of foot wide, say, by a few feet deep. And there's a, a there's a portion of, I think it's Fleet Street, actually, which is fun, more on that later, where they dug up the foundations for a building, found some Anglo-Saxon settlement evidence, and then they excavated it archaeologically and found, within about 40 by 10 metres, I think five separate cesspits. So, a cesspit in this period isn't just a poo pit. It's not just for human waste. There could be domestic waste in there, um, bits of bits of food, bits of bone, animal bone that you're not going to use afterwards, like pig bones and chicken bones and that sort of thing, fish bones. Uh, you'll have your plant waste, you know, the skins of your vegetables, the rotten bits that you chop off your apples, that sort of thing. All gets chucked into this pit, into the waste pit. Maybe you chuck a bit of straw, you chuck a bit of dry grass on top of it to just stop quite as much of the smell coming up, maybe. Uh, broken pottery, scraps of leather if you've repaired your shoes, the bits of fluff and waste thread from when you're repairing your clothes. And then, if you're having a cack in the middle of the night, you take your bucket and you dump it into the cesspit in the backyard. That's probably how the majority of people were getting rid of their waste. There is this kind of utopian dream that people were all taking all of their poo and spreading it onto their garden and growing their food with it. And yeah, that, that's a thing. You could certainly do that in a rural place. If you were living on a farm or a farmstead, there's 
probably a, a thousands of years of history of people realizing that stuff grows well in poop. Humans poop, they put the poop on the fields. But certainly from the archaeology that we've got, we know that people were filling pits with it. And obviously the best example of that is the Lloyds Bank coprolite, which is maybe the largest human uh, poo ever excavated. And it's, it's a coprolite, so it's basically a fossilised poo. It's not technically fossilised, but it's this amazingly preserved 8 inch by 2 inch brown trout, which is quite impressive, uh, from the Viking Age, from York, and it was dug up as part of the huge excavations they did in the late 70s into the early 80s, uh, and it can tell us a huge amount. Firstly, it was found in a cesspit um, with lots of other different types of waste, so I think we had leather and wood and um, vegetable matter. There's a wasp outside my window. I hope we haven't got a wasp's nest in the ceiling again. That would be rubbish. But it, uh, when, it was, when it was found... It was dug up, it's been preserved, it's now in the Jorvik Viking Centre, and it's been analysed, and the analysis tells us loads. So the person that, that produced this motion lived mostly off bread and meat, so they had a bread and a meat-based diet, a grain-based and a meat-based diet. The meat was probably mostly things like pork um, and fish. There was lots of fish being eaten in York in the Viking Age. It's a river, they were, they were catching eels and various other kinds of fish. They had lots of worms. And we know that because we've got the pupae and we've got the eggs of the worm in the poo. So this person was riddled with intestinal worms. And that's one of the things that investigating cesspits can tell us because we can go into the cesspit and you get these compacted layers and the layers can be identified as human waste or animal waste or vegetable matter or you know wood, charcoal, that sort of stuff. And one of the things you can do when you analyse the layer that turns out to be human waste is see what kind of worm eggs are in it. And if it's the type of worms that only people have, that only human beings have in their guts, I think one of them is called a ribbon worm, um, you'll know that's human poo. And you'll be able to basically say, OK, well, this person or these people, if you can't tell if it's one poo or many, had quite a lot of these worms in them. And from what we can tell, people in the Viking Age had so many of these worms in their tummies that they actually began to develop, like genetically develop ways of resisting damage from these worms being in the digestive system. So people like in Scandinavia started to actually genetically develop <laughs> resistance to these worms, which is amazing. They had so many worms. Anyway, we're diverting from toilet territory into poo territory here, and I apologise, but... Um, the point is, cesspits can tell us a huge amount about the people that used them, not just about what they put into them. And they put lots of different things in. So when we think about a Viking Age cesspit, we're not just talking about the outhouse at the end of the garden where you go to the loo. We're talking about the outhouse at the end of the garden where you chuck all of your waste in. So you've dug a nice deep pit in the backyard, you, you chuck everything in there, basically. It'll take a while for it to build up high enough that you either need to dig another pit out or you empty that pit. And this is where the night soil man comes in. So the other option, if you live in a city like London, is you have a pit that is emptied. And in London, we've got later medieval, I'm talking 13th, 14th century, laws, decrees, where you have to have a specifically sized pit. It's several metres by several metres in, in some cases, and it might be two by two metres, something like that, uh, which has to be either wooden or then stone lined later. So you have to have a properly lined pit, properly lined cesspit, no more than I think, or no less than two metres or the equivalent in feet away from your house. Like it has to be away from a house, away from a street. You have to have a proper pit. And then you'll have a night soil man or a gong farmer who comes and empties the pit. So this is somebody who's, whose job is to come and empty the waste from your cesspit. That waste is then taken and it's used in whatever industry it's needed in. So spread on the fields or used for various other purposes. Similarly, the urine, human urine, traditionally is, is very, very good for tanning leather. And in the later medieval and the early modern period, uh, the urine of people who drank strong beer was preferred. So if you like a, if you like a nice strong dark ale, you drink a lot of it and then you pee. You could save that pee up. These stone pits are not just things for your average urban dweller. They're, they're things that you get in castles as well. So your average castle, your average stone-built Norman concentric castle will have lavatories. It'll have toilets in it. And the nickname for these toilets in, in castles is a garderobe. Your garderobe isn't a wardrobe. It is a garderobe. So 
the, the wardrobe is where you put your clothes, obviously. The guard robe is where you poo. And there's a bit of an urban myth that it's called that because the smell of the toilet keeps the moths off your clothes and you hang your clothes in the guard robe. Um, personally, I think that might have developed from a joke where somebody says, crikey, if you, whoa, you could hang your clothes in there, the moths would never touch them. But I don't think that's actually what people were doing. I think that's an urban myth. I haven't found any actual medieval source material that says that people were hanging their clothes in, in the Kazi because the moths won't touch them because of the smell. That's, I'm not sure that's a real thing. Um, I think that's one of those jokes that people start taking seriously, like the idea that Welsh people call a microwave a pop to ping. We don't. Oh, uh, put this in somewhere. Um, I forgot to say thank you to my patrons who are wonderful and keeping me alive. And if you would like to support the channel financially, there is the Patreon page. There is the link to the coffee page. It is all gratefully received. Uh, and the Patreon is, is busying up slightly and there's some extra stuff on there these days. And uh, I'm starting to do things like live chats and extra videos. And we have a Discord and the Discord is great and it's got hundreds of people on it and they're all really cool. So give me your hard earned cash. And then I can pay somebody to edit these videos and they'll look so much better. Oh my God, can you imagine? Oh, anyway, on with the poo. There are some, there are some absolutely astounding castle toilets out there. Dolbatarn Castle in North Wales, I did a video on Dolbatarn, has a really well-preserved garderobe chute. It's a poop chute. They have poop chutes that take the waste from the garderobe down into a gong pit, into the big stone-lined pit that the gong farmer then empties. And there are places like I think Old Sarum Castle has these huge five meter deep gong pits. The only way of getting into which was by being lowered on a rope, as far as we can tell. So imagine if your job, your, your actual job, was to be lowered into a pit in the pitch dark to clean out the poo. That is your purpose in life, my friend. That is your station. Presumably this was a, a very unpleasant and not necessarily highly sought after form of employment, but uh, there are other ways of emptying pits as well. We know, for example, James I of Scotland had a sewage system, uh, quite a big sewage system in Grey Friars in the monastery at Perth. And this is later, obviously, but he was actually assassinated whilst escaping through his sewage system which had been blocked off at the end because he kept dropping his tennis balls into it. Somehow the tennis balls kept getting into the poop chute. I don't know how he was getting tennis balls down his poop chute. I don't want to know how he was getting tennis balls down his poop chute, but the poop chute was then big enough when it got to the sewer that he could walk through it and be assassinated by a gang of dudes. I mean, it's a bit like the Cloaca Maxima in Rome, right? Where Brutus rides down it on a boat. He has the drain enlarged so that it's big enough for a man to sail down it on a boat, which is a very sensible thing to do. London, in the medieval age, doesn't have these kinds of massive sewerage works, right? York in the Viking age doesn't have these massive sewerage works. So you've either got a pit in the backyard, you've got your stone-lined pit that the gong farmer comes and empties, you empty a poo bucket into the street if the situation is bad enough, like the poo pit's not been emptied for a while, well, we have no choice. It's meant to rain later today anyway, we'll just sling it out into the street, that's fine. Now, if you go to the Orvik Viking Centre, you'll see they've got a bloke straining behind a wicker fence. Is, is that what the toilets looked like? Well, we don't, we don't know. We don't know what your Viking outhouse looked like. Is it likely that it just looked like an outhouse with a little wooden door so that you could go in, have a bit of privacy, strain away for half an hour, read the paper, not the paper, read the vellum, and then come out refreshed? Maybe. We know that at least one Viking Age cesspit in Denmark had two post holes. So two post holes, not four post holes, implies maybe it wasn't like a full structure. It implies maybe there were just two posts at the front and then there was a wicker, uh, what do you call it, enclosure surrounding it maybe. Maybe it was just a wattle and, wattle and daub or just wattle around it so you've got a modicum of privacy. Maybe there's a slanted roof over the top resting on these two posts. You can reconstruct it in myriad ways. But Essentially, yeah, they had outhouses, they had places you go, you sit, and you relieve yourself, seats of ease, as they were known on Napoleonic warships. In big cities, so I'm going to use London again, because London's a great example. Actually, no, let's not, let's, let's use York. In cities like York, we know that in the later medieval age, so in the 14th century, 15th century, they were building proper 
dedicated lavatories, public conveniences, public toilets, like the Romans were building centuries earlier. Vindolanda, the Roman fort at Wind Windolanda, has this huge toilet where men were just sitting, facing each other, on stone toilets. Stone, stone slabs with holes cut in them. Poo goes down, water sluices underneath naturally um, to wash the waste away. Billy Connolly has a sketch about this where the lads at his dockyard where he used to work would be in similar situations where water would just be constantly running underneath to take all the waste away. In medieval cities like York, they were building them on bridges. So Ooze Bridge, the original bridge in York, originally was like this, this slightly humpbacked situation where they would build buildings on it. And one of the buildings contained toilets. How did the toilets work? A lot like in Bruegel paintings where there's just bums sticking out <laughs> and you do your business into the river, the river washes it down to sea. That's how it worked. It's, it's a simple answer to the situation. Were these toilets public conveniences run by the local authority? Yes and no. Sometimes they were run by the local government. Sometimes you would be charged, you know, you'd spend a penny. You'd literally spend a penny. It's kind of where the phrase comes from for having a pee. But in this situation, it was probably a lot less than a penny maybe a, yeah, like a farthing, a groat or something. Um, and you'd go in and then a government worker would be cleaning the toilets. In other situations, people would have them as their, their business. Like somebody would build this building with these toilets in. For example, in the 1420s, the Lord Mayor of London, Dick Whittington, yes, that Dick Whittington, built a gigantic toilet on the River Fleet that was meant to house 128 people, 64 men, 64 women. Can you imagine a public toilet? purpose-built with 128 seats in it. It must have been vast. Anyway, he built this public toilet on the River Fleet, on a bridge. Then somebody went in and they bought the business as a, what do you call it? Franchise. They took it as a franchise. You get these franchisees. There was one bloke called John De Fleet and his wife, I think her name was Cassandra. He was a hat maker, a cap maker. And in the 1100s, he had a building near the fleet which had toilets in it. And we know that it had toilets in it because we found the toilet seat. So archeologists in London found a, a 12th century toilet seat, which is amazing. Like it's an oak piece of oak with roughly hewn holes cut into it, just with an ax. They're just chopped in with an ax, not particularly comfy, danger of splinters on the gentle behind, but that's what the toilet seats look like. We've got a 13th century one from York. I think I've shown it on my community page already, but here it is. This is the 13th century toilet seat from the Coppergate dig in York. Purpose-built toilet seat. Looks just like toilet seats looked for hundreds and hundreds of years. The only difference now is we, we have an additional lid on the toilet seat and they're often made of plastic because people are idiots. But like I've got one of the toilets that I regularly use just has a wooden seat with a wooden lid. That's probably the most spectacular invention in, in toilet technology, aside from the flush, in thousands of years was the idea of sticking a lid on with a hinge. And were they putting lids over these to stop the smell getting out? Maybe. It's more likely that they just didn't bother. It was just this seat with a hole in it. But that is medieval toilets. They were basically as you imagine them. With one notable exception, they also had urinals. They did have urinals. There is a Norman castle. It's a 12th century castle on the south coast of England, whose name I've forgotten. Uh, it's not Ulverston. Is it Ulverston? Editing Jimmy will put it up there. And there's a urinal in it. There is a, a Norman urinal. And it, it is like, it is just like a, it's a pissoir. It's a hole in the wall with a little bit of a catchy catchy for the splashy splashy. It's Amazing. It's fantastic. This 900 year old urinal that you are not allowed to use anymore. And it, it does what you imagine. Like it leads into the poop chute and then it all goes down into the gong pit. And then the gong farmer comes in and he takes the poop out. It's, it's brilliant. It's as you imagine medieval toilets. Literally, there's not many surprises in this video. There's some reading in the description, but there aren't that many surprises. You think people chucked buckets of poo and wee out of the window into the street. Yeah, they did that in extremis. You know, hopefully you're going out the backyard and putting it into the into the poo pit. But like if it's freezing cold or if it's hammering down with rain, you just chuck it out the window into the street. It'll get washed away. It'll be fine. There was the, the streets ran with poop. The streets literally were running with poop sometimes. 
It was bad in a lot of places. It was bad in cities. People were just hanging their bums over bridges and pooping into the rivers. Like, it, it's... Yeah. It was happening. That was how it was working. And yes, there were big pits. And yes, the pits needed emptying. And so there were night soil men. And even up into the 19th century, there were night soil men regularly operating in big cities. Lots of places had cesspits. Lots of places didn't have access to a proper sewerage system. London, many Londoners in the Victorian age, in the 20th century, didn't have access to a proper sewerage system. And the night soil man would have to come round with a cart and empty a horrible, filthy business into the cart. And it was a nasty, nasty job. So there you go. I mean, give, give thanks. Give thanks for your toilet because they are an amazing thing. I do have friends who still regularly have to empty their toilets. They live on a narrow boat. In fact, if you go and follow boat time, Amy and Wes go into great detail about how narrow boat toilets work. You do, you have to find a place where you can empty your waste and then you empty your waste into the place. You sluice out the bucket that collects it all and you stick it back in the, in the toilet. Still going on, gang. Still going on. I have friends who will not pee in their toilet. They will only pee on their compost heap in the backyard. Get that good, get that, get that good chemical goodness. It's amazing. The ways we deal with our fluids and our solids. I find it fascinating. My eyes have gone really wide. I, I, I could write a book on this. Maybe I should write a book on this. I should write a book on this. I, I really hope you enjoyed this. I hope this was a fun little diversion for you and I'm glad I did this instead of doing the blood eagle because it was just grim but I hope you're having a lovely time I hope you're having a great week I hope you're safe um as usual thank you very much for joining till the next time bye bye don't forget to go to York Georgian Festival see you later